everybody, and welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. I'm Stelios Katsakis, CEO of One Business World. Leading Entrepreneurs of the World features entrepreneurs, founders, and business leaders presenting on cutting edge topics and the latest industry developments. Our goal is to provide the global business and entrepreneurial communities with a window into the minds of those who are shaping the future of the world. Today, we're very pleased and honored to welcome leading global entrepreneur, Ken Israel. Ken is a co-founding partner of Beyond Brands, a New York-based business development and marketing agency serving progressive, sustainable, plant-based, and mission-driven participants in the beverage, food, dietary supplement, cosmetic, and wellness categories. Ken is also the founder of Innovation Nutrition Consulting, a California-based boutique product development and innovation consultancy operating in the U.S. and Europe, serving leading dietary supplement, functional food, and nutraceutical ingredient firms. Ken is a member of the Natural Products Association, Comply Committee, NPA, is the oldest and largest trade association serving the natural products industry, working on the Committee for Product and Label Integrity. Ken has accumulated a lot of experience in contract manufacturing, product development, regulatory affairs and compliance, brand marketing, and operations, having held senior level executive positions with industry leading firms for over two decades. Ken has received formal training in nutrition and botanical medicine, and he is also a former practicing member of the American Herbalist Guild. Ken, it is a great pleasure and an honor to have you here with us today to hear more on the very interesting topic of how the dietary supplement industry is expected to grow. Thank you and welcome to Leading Entrepreneurs of the World. Stelios, thank you so much for um, making your guest this evening, or for, for me this evening, for you in New York this morning. I'm joining you from Tashkent, Uzbekistan. So this is truly one global business world, which is kind of cool. Um, for the audience, um, why am I here? Um, why am I speaking tonight? Um, Stelios went through some of my bio. Um, I've been working in the same field now for some 30 years. I started off as an herbalist and nutritionist. And from there, I um, morphed into product development. Um, the story goes a little bit deeper though. I actually started off when I was a, a child, I wanted to be a banker and was going to school for economics and um, kind of fell down the rabbit hole of herbal medicine and dietary supplements quite by accident. I was doing a senior research thesis and econometrics and did a workmanly job on a price um, commodity predictive model, um, looking at agricultural commodities. And uh, the teacher said, nice model, I'll give you a C for it. If you can break it, I'll give you an A. Um, and I found back in, the, um, back in the 1980s, a little explored niche in the, uh, in the agricultural world of organic food. And dove in and spoke to suppliers and retailers and distributors. And, that brought me into the realm of the health food store. And I had never tried organic food. I tried it um, at the behest of a, of a retailer. Um, ultimately, that guy became my mentor and one of my best friends. And he launched me into a career of, um, of dietary supplements and botanical medicine. I studied, I learned a lot, um, and took increasing positions of responsibility through the years. Um, most of my Corporate experience in the industry has been either in senior level product development roles for some major brands, some in New York, for instance, Country Life Vitamins, which is based out on Long Island. Um, I've also been in the contract manufacturing world and have worked for some of the largest soft gel, powder, and tablet capsule manufacturers in the US and globally. Um, I started my own firm, Innovation Nutrition Consulting, as a business development shop. Um, product development shop about six years ago and simultaneously was invited by colleagues who I had met along my travels in the industry to help co-found Beyond Brands. And that's really where my passion lies. Beyond Brands is a mission-driven organization. We focus on helping companies with ideas beyond just commerce, but actually to create a world that our kids want to or, or should be living in. I like to say should um, because the alternative is dreadful. Um, but we effort to create sustainable, better for you products that combine 
not only a product mission, but a social mission um, to help serve all stakeholders, meaning the consumers, the business owners, the suppliers, the retailers, all hands in. So this has been an amazing adventure. And today we're gonna to be talking about what's gonna be changing the dietary supplements industry. Um, we've been through an amazing year um, in many ways, some positive, some negative. And I think the coming year um, or years will also be quite remarkable. So let's talk further about why this talk matters. Um, what's the size of the prize? Um, first question most entrepreneurs ask, you know, what's in it? Well, the industry exceeded $50 billion before the pandemic. And the pandemic, the pandemic um, catapulted growth forward. The dietary supplement space grew. Some estimates on the low end were 12%. Some high estimates are 18 to 20% for last year, but it's roaring along and likely gonna cross the $60 billion line either this year or early next. Um, within that space, it's not all ships rose at an equal pace. There were some segments that were punished, some that did extraordinarily well. Um, the pandemic was a, um, a singular <laughs> once in a hundred year experience for all of us in many, many ways. So let's talk specifically about what changed in the dietary supplements industry as a result of the pandemic. The first and biggest driver were, was consumers needed to engage on their own well-being and wellness. And in the early stages of the pandemic, the mainstream medical community had little to offer. Unfortunately, this was new, it was a novel coronavirus. So people immediately started taking some intelligent guesses and some foolish guesses about what they could do to help themselves. And the aisles of the natural product stores, the vitamin aisles specifically, became very, very busy. Um, I would say more accurately, the um, online aisles became very, very busy. Um, immune health catapulted forward. Um, for a while, you couldn't buy elderberry. Elderberry is an example of a plant that the demand and sales grew over 100% in one year, which leads to some big questions in the industry because production of elderberry did not grow 100% in one year. We'll talk more about that in a, in a little bit, and that reflects back into some of my regulatory affairs experience. Um, many other nutrients emerged as well, things like vitamin D and zinc. And, these have turned out to be very, very robust bets from a scientific perspective. Other categories that took off were on um, stress and sleep. As we got deeper into the pandemic, as everybody crowded into their homes, as the anxiety grew, as the social fractures grew, stress, sleep, mental health suffered and people started making big moves using dietary supplements to help fill those gaps. And, you know, I think we're at a interesting crossroads in the industry in that dietary supplements have actually proven their value in that space, particularly a class of plants called adaptogens. Adaptogens are plants that help the body deal with a higher level of stress, um, help normalize the body's adaptation to stress and um, adaptogens, specifically plants like ashwagandha or Siberian ginseng, uh, rhodiola have done remarkably well and they do very well because people are getting amazing positive experiences using them. So two categories that took off very, very strongly were immune and stress. Categories that suffered early on in the pandemic and continue to do poorly until about the first year anniversary, anniversary of the pandemic were weight loss and fitness products. People were not going to the gym. A lot of people abandoned their regular workout. And unfortunately, with everybody wearing yoga pants and pajamas at home, uh, the need to look good or look our best, except from the neck up, like on the Zoom meeting, that went away. Um, that's changing now. That's changing in a very, very big way. And as the country opens up, as we return to some new normal, um, I'm expecting a massive, massive spike in fitness, in weight loss, and metabolic well-being. And I think one of the big takeaways from the pandemic was this was a pandemic within a pandemic. America did poorly vis-a-vis -vis many other countries 
precisely because of our obesity rates, our rates of chronic inflammatory disease, our rates of diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, um, and chronic inflammatory disorders like arthritis, like chronic um, digestive um, inflammation. There's a lot of other conditions where you, any kind of chronic itis, um, that background inflammation predisposed many people to do very, very poorly when COVID hit. We all remember the news of cytokine storms, and this was a major driver of morbidity and mortality within the pandemic. So um, all of this anti-inflammatory care, this metabolic health issues were quite important. Another big change within the pandemic was how we shopped. Um, there had been, as I think we we're all quite aware, a slow march to the, to, to the web. And prior to the pandemic, it was estimated that approximately 20% of commerce in the dietary supplements world was online. That shifted rapidly, very, very rapidly. It's estimated that we probably moved forward three to five years in two months. So online sales for a while were at 40 to 60% of sales. And frankly, the experience has been so good for most customers that they're not coming back to the store aisle to shop. They're continuing to shop online. Um, and this, this really will talk to some other very, very interesting trends in the industry. Um, another major factor was Amazon. When most people think shopping online, they think Amazon. And going back in the conversation a few moments to that question of credibility, the, cre the question of trust of sales of certain botanicals far exceeding their biomass, um, Amazon was where a lot of the skullduggery was happening. And Amazon during the middle of the pandemic was shown in numerous cases to be selling products that were not what they appeared or claimed to be. And thankfully, and I think correctly, Amazon took action finally. Um, Amazon put in new quality standards during the middle of the pandemic and these have been implemented recently. Um, they've implemented product testing, and product qualification standards very much in line with federal regulations. And um, it's improved the state of play quite a bit. It's caused some sellers some real heartache and heartbreak. And frankly, they deserve it because they probably weren't doing the right thing with their products. They were not testing effectively. So Amazon changing the rules made a big, big change in the industry. Um, I think the biggest takeaway though, from the shift to online and the shift, frankly, away from Amazon for some, for some retailers and the massive emergence of new companies in the direct to consumer space is the larger question of who controls the relationship with the customer. And if there's one key permanent takeaway from the pandemic times is he who owns the relationship with the customer wins. So what we now know is if I'm selling through Amazon, Amazon controls the customer. If I sell to a retailer, the retailer controls the customer. If I sell to an online shop, be it iHerb or Vitamin Shop, et cetera, et cetera, they control the customer. So the emergence of direct to consumer brands promoted through social media um, where there is a direct relationship and a micro-targeting of a very fiercely loyal fan base for that fan, I'm sorry, for those product lines, that appears to be part of the new normal and probably one of the most important takeaways from pandemic. There's been many examples of winning brands that are coming out of a very much a direct-to-consumer um, model and then re-expanding into retail, but maintaining their direct relationship with the end customer. Um, good examples of this would be brands like Ritual, which are now top in the top 10 globally. So this is kind of an interesting shift and segue in how dietary supplement products are sold. Um, who is buying them is also shifting quite a bit. So this is a, um, a, a, a dynamic and dramatic shift in, in the space. Um, 
when we look at the marketplace, um, there's also been um, on the business side of it, a lot of stressors that were brought on by the pandemic. Supply chains, like many different industries, came under increasing fatigue. Initially, it was hard to get ingredients. Um, I mentioned elderberry, ashwagandha, stragglers, many others. Um, it shifted very rapidly into specific components for products, such as packaging components. There's been massive bottlenecks there. Um, logistical challenges, shipping products to market, getting ingredients into country. I think we all remember the massive challenges that were experienced when people stopped flying. There weren't as many planes in the air. The bellies of those planes carry cargo. Um, this had huge implications. Drivers didn't want to be out on the road doing long haul trucking. So getting a truck to carry product became a massive hurdle and the price of logistics more than doubled for the industry. We're seeing now an emerging challenge in supply chains that I frankly think will have massive implications on business structure. Um, capsules are how 80% of new products that emerged during the pandemic came to market. Um, capsules were already how 60% of products reached consumers. Capsules have grown 30% year over year and we're entering our second year of compounded capsule growth. And no new capsule factories were built. And the result now is an impending supply shortage that will be impacting OTC drugs, pharmaceuticals, and dietary supplements. So I think the watchword for the second half of 2021 is as simple as ABC, anything but capsules in product development is probably a very, very smart move. We're going to see other supply chain challenges as we move forward in the coming year. And I'm gonna talk a little bit um, to that later in the discussion about how products are made and some supply chain structural issues. Um, what was changing already? Um, what was already going on and what are gonna be some of the big drivers of growth in, in the industry? Um, first and foremost is a shift to personalization in the dietary supplements world. And this is manifesting in lots and lots of different ways. Um, many people are having their genetics tested by companies like 23andMe and more sophisticated models. There is now um, various at-home saliva and blood-based testing that can test for various biomarkers, be it omega-3 or vitamin D or various stress hormones. So this is becoming quite popular. Many people wear smart devices, be it an Aura Ring, or a, um, a, 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 a um, Apple Watch or, men, or a Fitbit or many of the other wearable devices. And uh, Integrate or iHealth has emerged as a major, major trend where people are tracking their sleep, they're tracking their steps, they're tracking a lot of different metrics and they're beginning to share this data with doctors and they're also beginning to share it with dietary supplement companies. Um, so we have, um, you know, a number of ways into personalization. We have DNA, we have biometrics, we have biochemistry, we have microbiome, which is the commensal bacteria in the body. If we look at the human organism, I like to think of us more now like a bustling city, a complex ecosystem, not one single organism. If you look at a human being, there's actually in a human more cells in you that aren't you than there are cells of you. The, each human carries in excess of five trillion cells that are not them, that are other creatures. The majority of these live in the digestive tract. Um, it's your gut microbiome, but every millimeter of skin, your sinuses, the lining of your mouth, under your fingernails, you know, from your head to your toes, inside and out, your body is colonized. And if it wasn't, it wouldn't be working correctly. It's not icky bugs. These bugs are absolutely essential for one's health and well-being. And 
everybody's microbiome is very, very different, but we're learning at a massive pace right now about what the implications are of microbiome and how to influence microbiome. And microbiome appears to be one of the winning plays in personalism and personalized nutrition. So we have microbiome. One of the easiest ways to measure microbiome, by the way, which is a little bit icky for most people, is stool samples. But I think we're going to be talking a lot more about poop in 2021, 2022, and beyond. This is going to become a much more normalized conversation as this segment of health really starts to get explored. Um, the results of personalization are really going to go a couple ways. Number one is it's going to help people make intelligent choices about food. And there's going to be food delivery services, think Grubhub and Blue Apron, but for you specifically based on health outcomes and your needs. There's going to be dietary supplement recommendation services that shop for available products and give you your own personal mix. So, you know, everybody's, you know, just as much as I have my Pandora stations and my thumbs ups and dislikes have kind of customized those stations over the years, we're going to each have our personal DJ selecting products ideal for us as we move forward. A more nuanced approach to personalized nutrition is actually making doses specific to the individual. And we're at the very beginnings of that now. Having spent close to 20 years in contract manufacturing, 12 years directly and another eight to 10 years interfacing with contract manufacturers on a daily basis, the logistics of making products for each individual are daunting. It's possible, but they'd be extremely expensive and really only relevant to a very small portion of the society. So I look at this DJ model versus writing custom music for everybody model as to be as likely predominant for the coming years. That said, micro beadlets, micro tablets, 3D printing of product, um, custom drink mixes and powder mixes at home from cartridge fed machines are already emerging. And these are very, very exciting technologies and have some amazing investment opportunities for people who want to pursue the space. So personalization in nutrition is going to be a very, very exciting um, area. I started talking a little bit earlier about microbiome and the level of investment, the level of data coming out of microbiome is actually quite startling. And some of this is being led now by smart AI. Um, it was one thing to look, you know, for, to have a microbiologist look at a sample and evaluate it. When you're dealing with trillions of organisms from hundreds of genus and species, trying to manage this data became, you know, the, the realm of smart learning and machine learning. And this was some of the earliest implementation of AI into the industry. Now what we're beginning to see is the same AI being applied to um, plant biomasses and to nutrient development and protein development. And I'm gonna delve into this a little bit. Um, when we look at the typical botanical ingredients in the dietary supplements world, many times you'll see standardized or extracted herbs. And when people extract traditionally, they're looking for just a few actives. Um, I call that the known universe. And the known universe in plants is typically a very, very small percentage of the total plant. Even, you know, let's say we're looking at blueberries and we, you know, a lot of people are excited about blueberry anthrocyanins. These are the deep blue pigments in blueberries. Um, those represent a small one to 2% of the total plant mass. And most of the rest of the plant has not been explored. So let's call that the dark matter of the universe. It's impacting us. We know it's there, but we haven't really mapped it yet. AI and machine learning are allowing us now to look at the dark matter of the plant universe and start to explore mine and gain benefit from these compounds. And what I really see moving forward 
is number one, or I should say a plants 2.0, which A, starts looking at all of the enzyme systems in the body, all of the biological mechanisms in the body, all of the various mapped cellular receptor systems, and then goes back to plants and looks for compounds specifically to answer questions that you know, modern biology and modern learning will allow us to ask. So rather than relying, as we did traditionally, as I was trained, um, to look at um, basically history of use, tradition, um, and ethnopharmacology, um, the long history and relationship between people and plants, now we're able to ask questions in a very nuanced scientific manner um, and interrogate at a very, very high speed plant materials and plant bioactives for novel uses. And we're already beginning to see some early emergence of this. The other thing that we're able to do now is look at cellular systems and biological systems in the body and approach these in new and different ways, um, combining nutrients in ways that basically normal human thinking wouldn't necessarily come up with, but smart machines, well-trained machines are able to approach this. And already we're seeing the first launches of products driven by smart AI. So this is another transformational technology. The other area where I see some really fascinating growth is plant-based actives without plants. So looking at cellular biology, going back to that blueberry model again, growing blueberries is very, very inefficient. You have to grow a bush, wait for the bush to mature, harvest the fruit, extract the fruit, and hopefully you get a very, very small amount of these interesting pigment compounds that you want to consume. Why not take the components from the specific cells in the berries that grow the pigments and culture them and have them working as smart machine, plant machines, if you will, to crank out the compounds that you're looking for. Or in some cases, train yeast or funguses, fung fungi or other bioorganisms to do the work more efficiently. We're beginning to see this with cultured meat and cellular meat. We're also seeing it with cellular agriculture. And there's already some brilliant examples of yeast derived bioactives. Um, what, what is most shocking is that while these were initially genetic modification programs using CRISPR to yield the result, now we're getting into smart breeding without genetic modification that gets us to similar endpoints using endogenous biology in the plant. So no Franken foods, no GMOs, and still some brilliant outcomes from yeast, fungi, and other organisms. Algae is a, is a really interesting area to me. So plants without plants is a really big area to look at. Um, we also see kind of a return to our roots. And I know that sounds kind of um, asynchronous with all of the high-tech science, AI, machine learning, plant culture work, but consumers are moving back to whole foods and to much simpler formulations and products. So back when I was coming up in the industry, if I was gonna make a multivitamin, I'd try to find every single nutrient and cram as much of it in there as I possibly could. Now we're getting much smarter about it rather than saying, let's put everything in it is, what, do the what, what does the target of this product really need? What are they most likely to be deficient in? It's not quite personalized nutrition, but we're asking much, much smarter questions about the products that we're building and trying to build them in a way that's going to better meet the consumer's need, make it less likely that they're getting overdosed on nutrients that they don't need. Not that that happens very frequently, but it is a consumer concern. Um, and it, making more efficient products, easier to use products. We're also seeing a return to wholeness in plants. Um, so green foods and plant-based foods and plant-based proteins seem to be a emerging and long-term trend in the industry. This goes into a much larger meta-trend that's not 
only part of the dietary supplements industry, but I think part of the larger society as a whole, which is sustainability. Um, there's massive change and massive opportunity in sustainability in the dietary supplements world. This used to be the purview of advanced chemistry and synthesis. And frankly, if a lot of people knew where their B vitamins came from, they wouldn't be so excited about it. These are, you know, manufacturing facilities that take 10 minutes at high speed to drive past. Um, so enormous chemical synthesis shops, uh, that's beginning to change to a much more food driven, um, greener chemistry, um, less solvents, less aggressive solvents, um, in, in, especially for botanicals. So this return to wholeness and cleaner, greener chemistry um, and smaller footprint is absolutely emerging. Um, one of the lessons from the pandemic also was the longer your supply chain, the more vulnerable you are. So sourcing close to home, I could actually envision a time in the not so distant future where farm to table and hyper local food, your Sunday morning farmer's market merges with the dietary supplements community and there will be regionalization of products and regionalization of manufacturing and micro manufacturing where we'll be able to do things much more efficiently rather than running a gigantic synthesis factory, cellular culture and building simpler products lends itself to smaller footprints. Personalized nutrition lends itself to smaller footprints. So this may be in fact an interesting trend to look at and a um, bit of a note of things to come in the not so distant future. Um, sustainability also stretches into packaging and that was one of the first failures during the pandemic was packaging components. Um, I think packaging is in for a major, major refresh once we get our supply chains straightened out towards the latter half of this year. We're already beginning to see biopolymers and bioplastics being used. We're seeing the emergence of the first non-plastic and um, completely recyclable um, packaging components that are suitable for pharmaceutics and dietary supplements. So this is an area. So people who are into polymer science, people who are doing um, film technologies, this is really where the future lies. I think the age of the traditional plastic bottle or giant tub full of protein powder are probably much closer to the rear view mirror than they are to the, to the windscreen as we navigate the future. Um, we're already beginning to see some massive changes in this space. So, you know, to kind of go back through um, major drivers of change, you know, we had the pandemic, it changed how we thought about product. Um, there were losers in this category as well. Um, homeopathic medicine took a 20% nosedive last year. And I think that that may be indicative of some things to come in the industry where unless the consumer can deeply understand how a product works, if you can't explain it, you probably shouldn't be selling it. Um, that's a big lift for the marketer. It may in fact reverse some of the trends of the most impactful sellers of dietary supplements being 20 something, young, 20 something year old young women on Instagram. They seem to lately have much more clout than a PhD in a white coat with 30 years of experience. But um, I think being able to explain how things work, not just, oh, I had an experience is another emerging key learning from this space. Um, ownership of the customer, um, may buck up against that a little bit um, because the customer likes to feel involved, but uh, certainly an interesting time. Um, supply chain stress is gonna remain. And then we have all of these emerging trends. Other areas of excitement in the industry, um, certainly women's health is taking a huge step forward and women run and women owned companies have absolutely been a massive beneficiary um, of change during the last couple of years. And I expect that trend to continue quite a bit as we move forward. 
into the future. Um, I think I've pretty much um, gone through most of my planned agenda. If there are questions, I'll be glad to answer them. I'll also put in a um, note about my team at Beyond Brands at this point and say that um, we do quite a bit of um, deep dives and deep consulting into businesses in the health and well-being space, be it beverage, plant-based foods. I lead or I co-lead our dietary supplements vertical. Um, we also have um, simple dial a consultant services where you can book an hour of our time very, very easily if you have more simple questions you want to ask. So, um, you know, there's, um, again, lots of opportunities in different ways to work with Beyond Brands. Um, you, were, you were rolling in there, Stelio, so I don't, you know, maybe you can guide me along here for a moment. Ken, you uh, very informative, very educational overview of the dietary supplement industry. Uh, if anybody has questions, please uh, uh, reach out through uh, the Q&A section or, of course, uh, directly to Ken. Uh, extremely insightful points and updates. You made us much, much more knowledgeable and wiser on the topic. You spoke about some super great points, major drivers of change, the impact of uh, lifestyle changes, the impact of the pandemic. And one question would be from, from Blake. What role will testing assay? have been the maturation of the supplement industry? You know, I, I think Blake probably asks one of the most important questions. I've been, I've had the good fortune to sit on the Comply Committee at Natural Products Association and Comply is the Committee for Product Label Integrity. And this has really been the nexus of FDA, FTC and industry. And what we found here is very, very interesting. For the last decade, we've had a self-induced crisis of trust plaguing our industry. We have been our own worst enemy. And when I say we, it's not really us. <laughs> um, there's an ethical, honorable, compliant part of the industry and a lot of really destructive, crazy hangers on. And it's the, I call them pirates. Um, because they rob and pillage and have no respect for rules and laws. Blake asks a question about testing and transparency. Um, testing is one of the single most important things a company can do to assure they're not making mistakes. Testing comes in at many stages in the dietary supplements ecosystem. Um, a manufacturer of ingredients has a responsibility to test an ethical responsibility. Some don't. A contract manufacturer, a brand marketer, has a legally enforceable mandate to test under 21 CFR Part 111, which is the federal regulation that controls dietary supplement manufacture. That's the good manufacturing practices laws. So every incoming raw material must be tested for identity, for impurities, and for potency and finished products need to be tested again for that they, that they meet label claim. And that means that they have in them what they say they do and that nothing else has made it into the product um, and that it's gonna meet its expiry date. There's a couple areas where this becomes very, very interesting. Testing is real hard science and science is slow. The dietary supplements industry is business and business moves blindingly fast. Many, many times, oftentimes, the business gets out in front of the science and ingredients and delivery system technologies are introduced that confound the testing, that get out beyond the ability of testing, of real testing of um, what we would, you know, basically, um, look at as something that could be repeated across different laboratories and get the same results. Um, that, is, that, that has become a, a real challenge in the industry. And I think we have a moral and ethical responsibility to not build and sell what we can't prove. In the space of microbiome products, specifically probiotics, these live organisms that we're taking, um, stability, proper identification, 
um, has been a bit of a challenge, but I think some of the other trade groups and some responsible players in the industry have really stepped up in a brilliant way. Um, the International Probiotics Association, the IPA, has stepped in brilliantly with clear definitions, with organizing gene banks of specific bacteria, and really encouraging the industry to tie benefits to specific gene identified strains and substrains, numbered strains, um, so that the claims and the benefits that consumers expect that the potency of the products is actually met and delivered to the end consumer. So there's some areas of the industry that are notorious for adulteration, either intentional or accidental. Um, certainly the bodybuilding space with where you know the speed of business and the aggressiveness of the business has gotten way out in front of the science and way out in front of the laws and the regulations. That's been a problem. Sexual health and uh, specifically male enhancement has been an area plagued by problems. Um, hair health um, has been an area that's been plagued by problems. Um, testing and really double checking that the company is testing is helping that quite a bit. Amazon's new standards and the new um, compliance system that they've put in um, ISO 17025 um, is really helping things. It's not the best system. I think there are other systems that would have worked better, but I'm delighted that they took a big step forward. Um, and there are some leading contract manufacturers that are also making big, big advances in testing and in audit. Um, so that, that's another big step forward. Make sure that your contract manufacturer is at least audited by third parties. Not that that's a guarantee that bad things don't happen. There have been some third party audited and certified manufacturers that have done some you know, not so admirable things over the years. Are there any other questions that I can help with? Ken, you spoke about the, uh, the areas of excitement. Uh, so let's say which areas, whether health related, fitness related, general nutrition related, do you yeah. think uh, and you did speak about uh, most of these, but if you could kindly identify again, which do you think will be the areas where innovation is expected to emerge out, uh, out of and with the, the areas of focus for the dietary supplement industry? Which Absolutely. You yeah. Um, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic. Um, there's going to be, as far as quick and dynamic growth right now, um, metabolic health, weight loss, um, return to fitness is really important. I think immune health, which was far and away the biggest beneficiary of the pandemic, it's gonna correct a little bit, but it's not gonna go back down to where it was, not that it was ever in a really bad space. Um, immune health is gonna, I think, remain. I think as a society, we've taken some lessons from this. Some may call it scar tissue, I call it smart lessons learned about immune health. I wonder what's gonna happen in 2022 or 2023 or 2025 when the next flu season comes around. Are people gonna mask up? Are they gonna keep the hand sanitizer in their purse or on their desk or at the door to of the office? Are they gonna stay home from work and zoom in versus infect their peers? There's some big questions there. Um, Microbiome and gut health is the brave, new, fabulous frontier of the industry. Um, digestive well being and digestive problems affect greater than 50% of the population. And there's been an extraordinarily clear correlation between healthy microbiome and resistance to COVID, healthy microbiome and healthy metabolic state healthy microbiome and improved athletic performance, healthy microbiome and healthy glowing skin. They're and over and over and over again to oral health, sinus health, allergy relief, not having a kid with eczema and allergies, reducing the incidence of asthma as kids get older, et cetera, et cetera. So microbiome and microbiome wellness, and this includes probiotics, which are the live organisms, prebiotics, which could broadly be defined as their foods, and postbiotics, which is a new area um, of either formerly live cells, intentionally heat killed or lysed cells, or the metabolites of probiotic bacteria. So think things like 
propionic acid and butyric acid and acetic acid, the stuff that these live bacteria that are fermenting away in your gut produce. These are all super important, healthy things. And then symbiotics, the combinations of pre, pro, and postbiotics all working together. This will become as diverse an ecosystem of dietary supplements as there are dietary supplements now. In fact, composite products that include nutrients, botanicals, nutraceuticals, which are things that are good for you that aren't quite a nutrient and aren't quite a botanical, and these live organisms will all be doing an amazing dance of innovation and product development in the coming years. So this is an area of extreme innovation of very, very exciting, very exciting stuff. Um, mental health and mental wellness. And this is another area that benefits from microbiome health. I keep on repeating myself. I think you're catching a trend here, but mental health and mental well-being, stress, anxiety, this is a really, really big area. One area that I didn't mention in the main part of the talk that I probably should have, and I'm really glad you asked me the question again, is, and it's extremely relevant to this very moment, is the eye and brain connection and the devices that we use. Um, neurohacking, biohacking, cognitive enhancement with dietary supplements was a big thing going into the, going into the pandemic. And then it wasn't. And now it is again. So neurocognitive wellness in light of devices is absolutely important. I had a fabulous discussion today with a researcher who's living out on the Canary Islands, um, part of Spain, but really Africa. Uh, this afternoon, uh, my time, I, as you can see behind me, it's dark and the, the skyline of Tashkent is lighting up. But earlier this afternoon, we were talking about esports and dietary supplements. And if you think that and kind of come to the recognition that esports gaming is bigger than the movies, took a giant leap forward because of COVID. And I say bigger than the movies, esports is actually a bigger spend and many more hours than movies and TV. Um, and the implications of this on neurocognitive health and the eyes are the forward outposts of the brain and what all this blue light and watching screens is doing to our eyes and our sleep and our neurocognitive health and the reward cycle of games and that what that does to our neurobiology, very, very exciting space. And I think there's gonna be a tremendous amount of innovation and some real winners emerging already, but that game has yet to begin. That's gonna be a really exciting space. So the, this coming together of eye health neurocognitive well-being, focus, attention, anxiety, stress, and brain health is super, super exciting. Um, women's well-being, as I mentioned, um, there's a lot of topics that were kind of taboo to talk about that we're beginning to talk about a lot more. Um, there's an avalanche, a tidal wave of women entering menopause and all of the various needs from bone health and dealing with the hot flashes and sexual well-being are incredibly important. Um, it borders into this um, mental health area, but it's a whole category in and of itself. And there's just some phenomenal developments. Urinary tract health, a big area, both for men and women as us Americans age. Urinary tract health is going to be a big, big thing. We're going to start talking about it. Half of guys over 50 have prostate problems and have urinary tract problems. Well, guess what? More than half of women who've had babies, which is more than half of women, um, have urinary problems, incontinence, bladder leakage, et cetera. So urinary health is gonna be an explosive uh, category for growth um, in, in the coming years. Um, other areas is children's well-being and children's health. Um, kids are under increasing stress. You know, it, it's kind of neurocognitive well-being for kids and immune health for kids. Lots of really, really exciting opportunities for growth in the industry. I, um, I look at the next 10 years as absolutely amazing, unless I'm replaced by a smart machine. <laughs> Ken, you, you spoke also about some uh, trends that are expecting to be disturbing the industry if they're not doing this already, like the personalization of health, AI and tech the yeah. ritualization of nutrition, right? And mm -hmm. all of them constitute uh, very, very important topics for uh, lengthy conversations. So we'll do, it again. we'll do this again. But let's say yeah. on, on a global scale, 
in which countries should we expect to see most of the innovation in the space to be happening if you have some sort of, if you, if you could share some thoughts from sure, a sure. Traffic standpoint, where do you think most of the innovation is expected to be seen? Yeah, you know, this is really interesting because um, legal structures and trade structures influence this quite a, quite a bit. The U.S. Um, has always been affectionately referred to as the Wild West, where exciting things happen, and I think the U.S. will maintain a degree of leadership um, in innovative consumer-facing products. However, in the ingredient world there's an awful lot happening. China went from low-end commodity producer to high-end commodity producer to fast follower of innovation to innovator. And it's happening as we speak. And the force that they're leveraging and how well they're doing things now is astonishing. Um, so China is coming on strong in innovation. Europe has always had an amazing culture of in innovation. And while it was formerly Germany um, that led the way and to a lesser extent Italy, I see Spain and other countries in Southern Europe as well as Eastern Europe really coming on strong with extraordinarily innovative um, botanical production, um, ingredient preparations, delivery system, and then this whole area of microbiome development. When we look at microbiome, Eastern European has a huge tradition of fermented foods and comfort with fermented foods, and they're coming on strong. So this is a really exciting area. Um, you know, other exciting, you know, going back into this, these trends of things that are moving fast, um, I probably neglected to mention mushrooms in my discussion. Um, mushrooms as a category have absolutely, you know, mushroomed <laughs> like after a rainstorm over the last couple of years, um, experiencing double digit growth. And the best is yet to come. When we look at this coming together of the mushroom category and mental wellness, and frankly, the cultural phenomenon of psychedelics, some very interesting things are about to happen. Um, Johns Hopkins, NYU, USC, U, um, and other major schools around the country um, have done extraordinary research into mental health, PTSD, and existential fear of death in cancer patients, and psychedelic mushrooms are making amazing headway and being shown to be clinically relevant. This is likely going to be the, the realm of pharma and dietary supplements as we move forward. So just a footnote on that. So, but, you know, as far as innovation, I, I think I covered where the innovation is happening and it's exciting times. Well, Ken, you've made us very knowledgeable, wiser and smarter on this very important topic. Hopefully some fun too. <laughs> Absolutely. And thank you again so much for, for your presentation as part of the Leading Entrepreneurs of the World series. Incredibly insightful. And I hope everybody enjoyed it too, without any doubt. Thank you and uh, look forward to talking to you again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Delius. It's been a real pleasure being your guest. Thank you. Talk to you again soon. Thank you, Kev. Bye-bye.